Good evening. I'm glad you're back for the fourth installment of Signs of the End Times. You might want to have your Bibles ready in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and chapter 25, the book of Matthew. Signs of the End Times. I want to ask you to join me once more in Matthew 24, verse 10. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity, sin, shall abound, the love of many shall become cold. Because but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So we have more signs. Let's start in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. The gospel should be, if not heard, yet at least heard of, and it is. Because of, of radio, because of missionaries, even now with all of this live streaming, there's more gospel on the airways now than ever before. We, we joke sometimes here in the church that I need to be careful because people could listen to me from Saudi Arabia. So the world has its radio and its live streaming and that scripture will, is already being fulfilled. Verse 15. When you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy, the holy place in the temple, whosoever reads, let him understand. In the end times, Antiochus Epiphanes sprinkled pig's blood all over the Holy of Holies. He, and that is sacrilege to uh, the Jews. And again, it's going to happen. In Romans AD, Luke 21, 20, and when you shall see Jerusalem circled with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is near. Again, Antiochus Epiphanes happened before the time of Christ. But he's saying when you see the sign of that happening again, the Antichrist, the one world ruler, again is going to desecrate the Holy of Holies, the temple of God. And when you see that, that's just one more sign that that's going to happen. Next is the Antichrist, Revelation 13, 12. You might want to take a quick look at that with me. I don't have it on the screen here. I would like for you to follow along. Revelation 13, 12, the one world government. And if you're listening at all to all the news broadcasts, this coronavirus has caused people to start looking at having a one world government again, one world ruler, one world health care, one world economy. And in the end times, that is going to happen. In the end times, we're go you're going to be able to buy your food at a grocery store just by showing them the chip that's in your wrist. The microchip that's on your forehead will buy everything. It will be a cashless society. The born-again believer won't be able to have that. If he isn't already raptured, if he got saved after the rapture, he's not going to be permitted to buy, sell, or trade without the chip of the Antichrist. I've stalled a little bit for you to find Revelation 13, 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast 
and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose, whose deadly wound was healed. The Antichrist's wound is going to be, he's going to be wounded mortally. He's going to come back alive. He's going to resurrect from the dead. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He uses satanic powers. Satan does have power. Satan can do those things. Antichrist is going to call down fire out of heaven. Do not be deceived. Verse 14, he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which he had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give unto the image of the beast a statue. He had power to give the image of the beast that it should speak and cause that as many as would worship the image of the beast, as many as who wouldn't worship the image of the beast, would be killed. I lately have been reading uh, a book about the end times uh, by James Hitchcock. And in the middle of this book, he lists four things about the, about the future world that has to happen. You see, in the future world, Russia, Magog, is going to have a confederacy of Iran and other countries, the Turkeys and all the stands, and they're going to come down and attack Israel. And... Uh, when they attack Israel, the European Union, those nations will protect Israel under the guidance of, of the Antichrist. He's going to destroy the, the Middle East attack on Israel from Russia, war with Russia. When he, he does that, though, four things have to happen before... Before this happens, he says, and he wrote this book in 2007, and he acts like in 2007, it seems impossible. But in 2007, he said this, four things have to happen for any of this to happen. First, he says the Middle East, America has to retreat from the Middle East. Now, excuse me, but if you're following along in world history, whether it be good or bad, President Trump has been taking our people out of the Middle East. He's been saying, leave it up to them to rule their part of the world. Part of that was oil. We needed their oil, so we needed to be there. But at this point, we don't need their oil. We've got more oil than we can use. So again, what did he say? We, America, would have to retreat from the Middle East. But we're there, he said, because of oil. But we don't have to be there now. And President Trump has been baby-stepping us away from the Middle East. Number two, he said, he said war with Russia can't happen. It can't happen as long as our economy is so strong. Uh-oh. What happened? Our economy is not so strong. At least during this point of history, I don't know if it will rebound. At this point in history, this is the weakest our economy has been since the Great Depression. He says, he says that uh, we have to retreat from the Middle East. He says that our economy has to be destroyed. Three, he said there must be pestilence. What? That's right. That's right. There must be pestilence to satisfy all the scriptures about the, the future end times. And here we are. And if this isn't the one, this coronavirus, there might be something else and something else. But don't you dare be afraid. It is just the baby step toward the beginning of the end for us. 
So again, he said there must be pestilence. And four, the one that hasn't changed yet is our military strength is so, is so big. And he's saying that during this war with Russia, America, our military must have been diminished tremendously. Just an interesting read that I, that I got hold of. I want to share with you the great escape again. Verse 16 of Matthew 24. Verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field be turned back for his clothes. Woe unto them that are pregnant with child and to them that give that are nursing in those days. Then he says, but pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Two thoughts to consider here. One, it becomes Christ's disciples in times of trouble and tragedy to be much in prayer. What did he say? But pray ye that your flight be not in winter. It becomes Christ's disciples in times of trouble and tragedy to be much in prayer. Though the comfort of the body is not to be mainly considered, it ought to be duly considered. It's okay to pray for safety and comfort. Though we must take what God sends whenever he sends it, yet we may pray against bodily sufferings. In times of imminent peril and their coming, in times of imminent danger, it is not only lawful, but our duty to seek our own safety by good and honest means. And if God opens a door of escape, we ought to make our escape. Otherwise, we do not trust God, but we test God. There may be a time in our future when those that are in Judea, where God is known and his name is great, must run to the mountains. And while we are only going out of the way of danger, not out of our way of duty, if there is work to be done at home, stay home. In times of danger, when it is obvious that we cannot be useful at home and may be safe somewhere else, God's providence calls us to make our escape. He that flees may fight again. The Apostle Paul set that example. In Acts 9.23, the Jews in Damascus were trying to hunt him down and kill him. And the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their lying in wait was known of him, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Verse 25, then the disciples took him by night and let him down over the wall in a basket. The Apostle Paul teaches us that when we can, it's okay to escape. And that was at the beginning, very beginning of his ministry, because he escaped and didn't test God, he was able to do so much more for the Lord. I'm back in, I'm back in Matthew 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation. This is Jesus speaking. What he says he means. Then shall be great tribulation such as were not, was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there shall be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's, the chosen's sake, those days will be shortened. More night, less day. When it is bad with us, 
we ought to say, Blessed be God that it is not worse. Blessed be God that it is not the endless eternal suffering of hell. When bad things happen to us, one thought beats hell. Whatever's happening beats hell. Coronavirus beats hell. It was a grieving church that said, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Those days of tribulation. Again, Matthew 24, 29, Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Verse 30, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes or the peoples of the earth mourn and cry, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Wow. Wow. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth, they shall wail because of him. I, I look out my window every day, and I say, maybe today. Maybe today, Lord, I'm looking forward to your coming back even today. Even so, I will accomplish what I can if given today. Wow. They shall wail because of him. When they see him, when you see Jesus coming in the clouds, will you wail? Will you have regret? Will you fear his coming or will you applaud and get ready? In verse 31, he shall send his angels. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect, his chosen people from the four winds, winds from one end of heaven to the other. And he goes on in Matthew 25. To explain this, it will be a wonderful time. It will be a terrible time. Watch this. I'm in Matthew 25, verse 31. Some of the most wonderful times, some of the worst of times. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory and before Him shall be gathered all nations and He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his goats from the sheep. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you since from the foundation of the world. What a glorious, glorious announcement that's going to be. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35 of that scripture. Here's the description of the blessed ones that will inherit the kingdom. Look at this. For I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. 
Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and fed thee thirsty and gave thee drink? He says, when, when did we see thee a stranger? We say that to the Lord. When did we see thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or, or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto me? And the king answered and said, Behold, verily I say to you, inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Who are the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom of God? The doers, the ministers, the servants. Servants to the least of these. Chapter 12 25 verse 41 he said depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared prepared for the devil and his angels verse 42 these are the these that were on the left that didn't do these things Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Why wouldn't they do that? So many different reasons. Mostly self-centeredness, selfishness, pride. Mostly having so many things going on around them, keeping them busy. They just forgot to serve God. Verse 42. Verse 41 again. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and ye didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee hungry or a thirst or a stranger or a naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say to you, inasmuch as you did it not to the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, everlasting, eternal. No chance, no appeal, no but, but wait, but wait. I was so busy, I couldn't help, no excuses. These shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous, the doers, the caregivers, the servants, they will go into their kingdom of heaven. Wow. For this message, I just want to say this. Not only is the king coming and he's going to change everything. Not only was there going to be judgments, good and bad. Not only that, but even now he's in charge. Even now, he sits on the throne of heaven and he is moving and manipulating things around. Who would ever guess that we might, as an America, as a nation, be pulling out of the Middle East? Who would ever guess that our economy would tank? Who would ever guess that there would be pestilence going on in this world like never seen before? Who would ever guess that our military might might be diminished so that Russia, Gog and Magog, might come down from the north to attack Israel in the end times. Well, I just know this. There are so many signs of the end times. We are not to fear. They are our salvation. They are for us. We are to be patient and trust God no matter what. Trust Him no matter what. Make Him your Lord and your Savior. 
because he says what he means. Lord Jesus Christ, I just ask you, dear Lord, on behalf of all of us, of all these that are listening to me now, I say, dear Lord, come. Come quickly. Even even though things are terrible and a mess now, they're not close to what they're going to be. When one-fourth of the world dies and then one-third of the world dies and so many horrible, horrible things that are going to happen. Even so, come quickly, Lord, rescue us. If not rescuing us now with the rapture, with your appearance, rescue us, Lord, from these circumstances that we're in. Children at home from school, people at home from work, people afraid of disease, asking you, dear Lord, to intervene, take charge, be our Lord, the Lord of our life. We give you all this to you and trust you no matter what. In Jesus' name.